Welcome everybody to Congregation Lador Vador. It is June 22nd, 2021. We're here with Rabbi Barry Silver, um, our rabbi for Congregation Lador Vador, and our guest, Rabbi Zvi Khan. And we are having our chat with two rabbis. And uh, we're looking forward to chatting with you guys and hearing about the Torah <laughs> and everything else. So take it away, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Sharon. There's a great passage to talk about. We're uh, reading about Balak and uh, Bilam this week. And as I usually do, I'll turn it over to Rabbi Khan to get the ball rolling. It's a fascinating passage, and uh, I'm sure we're going to have a lot to say about it. And I have some questions that I'm interested in asking Rabbi Khan, and hopefully he'll have some questions to ask me as well. And I'd love, look forward to hearing from all of you to get your input and feedback on this uh, passage, as well as what's going on in the world today. Rabbi Khan, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure to be here. So uh, very unusual story in this week's uh, Torah portion. Uh, very uh, unique, I would say. Uh, this, this, Basically, to give a little background, um, the Jewish people have uh, just uh, conquered two great uh, nations pre before this. And this is all before entering the land of Israel, but two nations uh, came to war and to fight against the Jewish people. And under the leadership of Moses, they, uh, the Jewish people conquered these two nations. And so the next nation up, so to speak, which was a nation called Moab, uh, was uh, very concerned about the fact that the Jews were coming close to their borders. And so uh, the king, Balak, uh, hired a professional cursor. I don't know if that's a, pro if, if that's a profession that exists today. Um, I imagine it, it probably does in some societies, but they but they hired this, uh, as Rabbi Silver mentioned, they hired this man named Bilam in, in Hebrew, and, uh, and, uh, and his job, and he was supposed to have a wonderful reputation, an excellent reputation as a cursor. So they thought, let's bring in this Bilam and have him curse the Jewish people. And once he curses the Jewish people, then they will be weakened, maybe even destroyed by the curse. But cer certainly they'll be weakened and they will not be able to attack uh, the people of Moab, which was Balak, again, Balak's uh, nation. And, uh, and uh, this Bilam is such an unusual, interesting figure in the Torah. I think what's most fascinating about it is that the Torah takes for granted that Bilam actually communicates with God and God communicates with Bilam. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of refreshing, I guess you might say, for the Torah to be so open and, and uh, transparent about the fact that, uh, that uh, God would communicate with this um, non-Jewish person and this person who had no connection to the Jewish people whatsoever and doesn't seem to be a particularly holy or uh, spiritually high-level person. Uh, but God does, in fact, communicate with him. And the Talmud says that he was a man of great spiritual potential. How he used his spiritual gifts and his prophetic powers was really uh, problematic, uh, but that he was a, a person in his way on the level, had the potential to be on the level of Moses. Uh, and, uh, and so um, he says to the, his, the emissaries who come to get him, he says, I can't go with you because God doesn't want me to curse the Jewish people. But ultimately, he agrees to go. And he tells them, I can only say what God tells me to say. And the Torah has these wonderful scenes where they bring him to curse to specific locations and places. And they say, this is a perfect place. There are the Jewish people in the valley. Look down on them, Bilam, and curse them. And Bilam actually utters these beautiful words of blessings on the Jewish people. And then they go to a new location and the same thing happens. He's, he's told to curse them and, and he utters these beautiful blessings. And this happens three different times. And some of those blessings, by the way, which I also think is, is so uh, unusual and interesting, some of the blessings that this Bilam, this professional cursor, um, utters 
are used in our prayers. For, exa for example, there's the, the very beautiful prayer that's in the morning prayer service of how goodly are, the, are thou tense, O Jacob, um, which Bill, which the source of that phrase, how goodly are thou tense, how, how goodly are thou tense, O Jacob, comes from Bilam. He, he's the one who says those words when he looks out on the tents of the Jewish people, and instead of, again, instead of cursing them, he blesses them. However, in the end of the, in the, end of the uh, story, Bilam uh, proposes or suggests to his host, he says, look, I told you in the beginning, I can only do what God tells me to do in terms of blessing and cursing. I don't have any independent power here. So I, bl I bless the Jewish people. But if you really want to get them, if you really want to hurt them, the way to do it is to get them to commit sins, and especially sins of sexual immorality. And so the Torah relates that, the, uh, that they sent young women from their nation of uh, Moab, uh, Moabite women, and, uh, and to, to seduce the Jewish men and to get them uh, to worship idols, to worship the gods of their nation. And this, this in fact, did cause a spiritual drop in the people, and, uh, and it, it, brought it, to, it brought to be, so to speak, a, a curse. Uh, on the Jewish people, but not because of anything Bilam said, but rather because the Jewish uh, men uh, were seduced by these young women and were seduced into idolatry or and uh, and sexual immorality. And and one of the lessons that the Torah portion kind of ends with is that the Jewish people always have to be very careful about their behavior because based on their behavior will be their status and will be their success or failure in the world. So just uh, so different than any of the other, I think, of the other Torah portion, such an unusual story and a fascinating story. Well, the uh, passage is fascinating, as uh, Rabbi Khan says. It also has a prophecy about today, because today we see a lot of people in politics who are uttering complete nonsense. And in this passage, you have a story about a talking ass. And so that is actually predicting much of what we hear that goes for political discourse today. The, uh, the donkey of Balaam actually speaks to him and uh, has better vision than Balaam does because there's uh, something in the way, a, a danger in the way and so the donkey won't go forward and Balaam is, is infuriated and is striking him. And he says, can't you see? And I think what the story is trying to tell us is that even the wisest among us, the most prescient, the people who have the greatest vision are still practically blind compared to what ultimate reality is. And there's things in our way that we can't see that we need to try to become aware of uh, in, in this story, I believe that Balaam, the, uh, the prophet, is one of the greatest prophets ever and has heights of morality that transcend virtually anyone seen in the Bible because Balak, the uh, king of Moab, is offering him incredible wealth and saying, here, I'll give you all of this wealth and all I have. All you got to do is say something bad about the Jewish people. Today, most people wouldn't require anything to say something bad about the Jewish people. You wouldn't have to pay them anything at all. They just voluntarily spew all types of hatred. This guy, it's like he's promised the world. And he says, nope, can't do it. Sorry. I can only tell you what God's telling me to say. Or in modern parlance, we could say, I can only tell you what I believe to be true. I'm not going to slander a group of people in order to advance my own personal interests. And so he comes out with this profound statement. What I think the Jewish people can learn from the story also is that as much as Balaam was offered to curse the Jews, why didn't he? According to legend, he looked down upon the Jewish people and saw them living peacefully with their families, dwelling in tents, 
And he was just motivated and moved to say, how goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, thy dwelling places, O Israel. Which means that the best way for us to combat anti-Semitism is to live up to the highest ideals of the Jewish people and to set a great example for others. And in that way, we can get other people to hopefully say good things about us. Oh. I'm not suggesting for a moment that we rely exclusively on that and that we hope to completely wipe out anti-Semitism just by being good people. Because I believe that there are endemic reasons for anti-Semitism, which transcend our ability to overcome it just by good behavior. There's historical and religious reasons that we must be aware of. But one of the arsenals in our toolbox of combating anti-Semitism is to turn people around by how we behave. Some Jews sadly do the opposite. They act very isolationist. People say bad things about us, so we start saying bad things about the outside world and start isolating ourselves and wanting nothing to do with them. That is not the way. The proper approach is for us to reach out to other people and to be loving towards them. Uh, my father adopted that attitude. Uh, he was uh, very involved with the Temple of Understanding and interfaith outreach, and he believed the best way for Jews to overcome anti-Semitism is for people to get to know us and to see us in a positive light. And I think that's one of the most important things about this story of uh, Bila and the uh, donkey, that we can overcome anti-Semitism by behaving well towards each other and towards others. Uh, Rabbi Khan, I'll turn it back to you and then we can open it up to uh, others. First of all, I, I want to say I, I love the point that you, I, I, I love what you said totally, but I love the point, the last point you made about the lesson of, of, uh, of, of Bilam, one of the important lessons being that uh, the way we, the Jewish people live, the way we conduct ourselves, the way we act, the, uh, can definitely have a positive influence on the way the world sees us. And, and, and there will be people who, because of their exposure to that, um, view us in a positive light as opposed to a negative light. And there's no doubt that through the years, uh, many, many, many uh, non-Jews have changed their views about the Jewish people because of exposure and reading and realizing that uh, the Jewish people, uh, not without exception, but for the most part, are always trying to do constructive and positive things in the world and have brought so many benefits to the world, not just, I'm talking now, not just the state of Israel, which is, which, which is do, doing so many amazing things and positive things, but also just the Jewish people at large around the world, so many Nobel Prize winners and doctors and, and scientists and people who are just trying to do good things and help improve the experience of humankind. Uh, so I, I think that's a beautiful point uh, to bring out, to extract from the Torah portion. I just did, I wanted to mention one more thing I don't know if anyone's seen it, but it turns out that Rembrandt did a magnificent portrait of a scene from this uh, uh, Torah portion. And it's, uh, it's, it shows such incredible insight into the dynamics of what's happening. Um, it's, a, it's the picture uh, of a scene that Rabbi Silver alluded to where uh, Bilam, this, this prophet is on his uh, donkey and he's on the way to go with the officers of Moab who have been sent to bring him. <clears throat> and an angel of God appears in front of them to block the path. And only the donkey sees the angel and Bilam doesn't. And, and, that's, and, and that's the scene that's depicted there. If you haven't, uh, if you, uh, after tonight, if you Google uh, Rembrandt's portion of that, a, a portrait of a, a painting of that scene. Um, I guess you would, you, I guess if you just did Rembrandt and a painting of, uh, of, let's see, I'm not sure. I don't remember the exact title of it, but you probably could play with the story a little bit and come up with it. It's such a fantastic painting that really shows, as, as do other of Rembrandt's paintings, amazing insight into biblical scenes and capturing kind of the looks on their faces and the psychological dynamics as well. So I encourage everyone to take a look at that. Rabbi Khan, I would like to ask you um, about Balaam. You indicated that he induced the uh, Jewish men 
to be seduced by the uh, Moabite women. And uh, because of that, God then turned his back on the Jews. And so he was able to help the enemy. It's my understanding that that assertion about Bilam is not from the actual Torah. It's not from the Torah reading. It comes out of the Talmud. And I think they surmise that because in this passage, you have Bilam saying great things about the Jewish people. And then they go their separate ways. Balaam and Balak go their separate ways. And then the next thing you know, it says that the Jewish men were consorting with, uh, with these women. And so I believe then from that, the Talmud infers or comes up with a claim that that was Balaam's doing, that he had something to do with that. And, and the reason why I raise that point is because to me, there seems something incongruous in the Torah, in the, not the five books, but in the, in the whole Torah, where Balaam, if you just look at this story here, presented in the book of Deuteronomy, Balaam comes out to be a fantastic moral character. He's a prophet of God. He has the gift of prophecy. He could curse the Jews. He renounces all the wealth that was promised to him, and instead, he blesses the Jewish people. So he looks like he's a stellar human being that should be a great hero of the Jews. Later on, I don't know what book it's in, maybe Judges or Kings or somewhere later on, it just mentions in passing that Balaam was exterminated along with, uh, as part of the genocidal wars that the Jews were fighting, it says, and also Balaam was also exterminated. And so there's a problem here in the Torah. Wait, if he was such a great guy, why was he wiped out? Similarly, if the father-in-law of Moses, Jethro, was such a great guy that Moses actually listened to him and followed his advice, and he was like a confidant of Moses, why were all of his people, the Midianites, why were they all exterminated? I mean, didn't that count for anything? And was he exterminated too as a Midianite? So there's a problem there. So to cure the problem, the Talmud says, oh, and then they just make up something. Balaam's the one who did it to justify why he was slaughtered. I was wondering if you uh, can shed light on this and if you would agree with my observation that according to the Deuteronomy, it comes across stellar. And so the Talmud has a little explaining to do. And so they... I'm sure you would say, well, that's part of the oral law. This was actually something they didn't know, but it, it was cleaned up a little bit in the Talmud. Does that jive somewhat with your understanding of it? So let me speak to that. I, I, I think it's a good idea to separate a discussion about Moses' father-in-law, Jethro or Yitro in, in, in Hebrew, and keep that separate. But let's focus on the first point that you made okay. about, about, uh, about Bilam. It is absolutely true. You're 100% putting your finger uh, on, uh, on the point accurately. And, and I actually, the way I said it, uh, gave a misimpression of the truth because I said it as if it was part of the Torah narrative. And the Torah narrative itself, it does not emphasize, does not say that uh, Bilam uh, was uh, was the one who made this suggestion to say to the people of, uh, to the king of Moab, uh, to Balak, listen, you wanted me to curse them, which I wasn't able to do, but if you want to get them, seduce them, get them to sin, and that's their weak, that's their Achilles heel, that's their weak point. That is not stated in the Torah. That, in fact, does come uh, from the Talmud. You're correct about that point. So, and it's not the only time, it's not the, it's not uh, at the only time in the Torah where we might read about a certain figure, and from the Torah narrative itself might think, well, this is either a good person, as in this case, or this is not such a bad person. Uh, I think a good example is Esau, or Esau in English, uh, one of the sons of Isaac, of Yitzchak. 
Um, in the Talmud, he's viewed as a really, really wicked, bad guy. But if you read the Torah narrative, and each year when we read that Torah portion back in Genesis, in the book of Genesis, I always say, I always think to myself, he doesn't seem like such a bad guy. How come the Tal Talmud kind of has it out for him to make him seem like such a bad guy? And, and the truth is, it's not just the Talmud. If you read um, later uh, stories and later books about the nation that came from that descendant that uh, he was the progenitor uh, for the the, the Emirates. Um, they were some tough characters and some tough uh, tough people. And 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 but it's interesting to kind of note the point that you're making in other places in this situation, other places as well, between the Torah narrative, which might present a certain picture in this case, a positive picture, and the Talmud's viewpoint. Um, one of the one of the reasons I think that the Talmud develops uh, developed this very negative viewpoint about him, about Bilam, is that um, they, they felt, the rabbis of the Talmud felt like the narrative is coming right out and telling us that God said to him, don't go. These people are going to come to you. They're going to ask you to curse the Jewish people. Do not go. And Bilam, this is in the narrative, <laughs> says to God and asks him, can I go? No. Can I go? Can I please go? Can I go? And 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 so the Talmud is like, why is he why is he seemingly so interested in going to curse the Jewish people and going with these officers when a truly upstanding uh, moral uh, figure would have said to them, absolutely, I'm not going. Of course, I'm not going to go with you. I have no desire to curse the Jewish people. I would never want to curse the Jewish people. But that is not the stance that he seems to take. So I do think. And I think this is often the case. I do think that there are hints in the text itself to this negative perception and this negative view that the Talmud develops. However, that is a those little hints are a big stretch from saying he is the one who came up with this plan and he is the one who said it and he is the one who hurt the Jewish people. Um, and that is not that you're right. Is there's no way to claim that that's clearly stated in the text. Um, I do want to shift over to the, you mentioned Moses' father-in-law in Yitro. There is a lack of a clarity in the Torah text itself as to exactly what happened to Yitro because he comes to visit the Jewish people. He's accepted and honored. He makes suggestions, as you mentioned. Moses accepts those suggestions, which become a part of the, of the life of the Jewish people in terms of their court system and how to decide legal matters. So he is a very esteemed and honored individual. And then at one point he says, I'm leaving. And it's very strange that he leaves. And there, and then, and then there's a discussion about did he did he appears later? Did he come back? Did he stay? Did he never leave? What happened to him in the end? But and you're right, the the, the Midianites were not were not given any uh, particularly nice treatment uh, from the Jewish people. But you it, you have a gift for understatement, Rabbi. Right? <laughs> not nice but, treatment. They were annihilated, weren't they? <laughs> But Jethro's own family, the Torah does go, go uh, point out that Jethro's own family was given a portion in the land. And later on in the book of Joshua, it talks about when all the wars were going on and the battles and the fighting, Jethro's own family and descendants were protected and were, were, were maintained in the land of Israel with their own inheritance. Uh, so, so there was a, there was a, sign of mark of gratitude and, uh, 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 and, and thanks to uh, uh, in respect for what Yitro did. But Bilam, the questions you raised about Bilam, I think are right on target. And it's a very valid point to raise as to why the Talmud views him so negatively when you don't necessarily see that at all in the Torah text. It's an excellent well, point. Jet Jethro was also given a, a great plot of land in Beverly Hills on the, uh, <laughs> on the Beverly Hillbillies. I mean, he was amply rewarded. He struck oil and has given a lot of land in, the, <laughs> in Beverly which Hills. One, so, which one was Jethro, the old man? Which uh, one was Jethro? Jethro was, was the Jeff son. Clampett. Jethro was the kid. Oh. The kid. Okay. The kid. The, kid. <laughs> the kid. The kid. The kid. Yeah, you know, they're all Jewish. There's, um, there's Jethro. The father, the old man, had a Hebrew name. His name was Jed, but it was short for... Yadid Yahoo. Oh, Jedediah. Jedediah. Je yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And then the daughter also had a Hebrew name. Her name was my, the God, my God of the waters. Her name was Ellie May. 
<laughs> Ellie May, that's right. Ellie May. Wow. How do you remember a Lee? <laughs> a Lee is pure Hebrew and May is the waters, the waters of my God. So wow. they're they're all they're all Jewish. Just like the um the first cowboys were all Jewish, the um the Cartwrights. You got Binyamin Cartwright, you yeah. got little Yosef, Joseph, yeah. and then you got Adam Cartwright. And then in uh, the actors were Lauren Green, who is Jewish. And then you also had Michael Landon, who was Jewish. So they, they were all given great land on the Ponderosa, <laughs> these guys. Because <laughs> they were descended from the tribes of Reuben and Gad. The, wow. Do you remember the ones who had the, ca the cattle? They had the, they had the cattle and they said, this is cattle country. Well, they, they must have been descendants of Reuben and Gad, I suppose. Because wow. they were the first cowboys. Anyway, um, if anyone has any comments they'd like to share or questions on, uh, on Balaam, let us know. Otherwise, we'll move on to bigger and better things. Well, I actually do. I have the picture, the painting, the Rembrandt painting. I found yeah. it online. So give me a second. I'll share that with people. Unfortunately, it's from Wayfair.com, but... <laughs> Oh wow! But, uh, I believe this is the painting that you were talking about with the angel and the donkey, and yes. and Balaam is striking the donkey. And there's some <laughs> other characters back here. I'm not sure who they are. Um, That's maybe... great that you were able to find it. Thank you, Sharon. Yeah, those are <laughs> in the Prophet background. Balaam and the donkey. So it was pretty yeah. easy. So in the background, those are the officers of of the King oh. Balak who were sent to yeah. bring him. Uh, and there's. If you if you get if you kind of blow up the picture, you'll see they're looking with disdain at 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 this guy striking his donkey. Like, what is his problem? And right. also, they're on these big stallions. They're on these horses, and he's on this kind of lowly donkey, and the, and he's striking his own donkey. They of course don't see the angel. They don't perceive right. the angel. Right. It's a right. wonderful, right. wonderful painting. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Thanks, Sharon. The other thing that's okay. very funny about the story is that. The donkey uses really great logic. He's, he's a very rational donkey. He says, he says to Balaam, he says, you've known me for a long time, right? You know, I've been your faithful donkey. I've never led you astray. Wherever you wanted to go, I went. I followed your orders. I've always been loyal to you. All of a sudden now I'm saying, hey, you might not want to proceed further. Hasn't it occurred to you that maybe there's a good reason why I don't want to go forward? Like, why are you beating me? Don't you realize that there's something going on here that you don't get? He's like, he uses really great logic with him. And Balaam, who's supposedly this visionary, doesn't quite get it. But that, that's a great painting. Thanks for uh, sharing that. That is nice. That is nice. It's a great story. Thank okay, you for Harris, both sharing. Ahead. I have a question. Inasmuch as the Torah was written thousands and thousands of years ago, by I guess brilliant writers, does it get updated through the years? Does it change? Well, if you're if you're an Orthodox Jew, the Torah can't be updated because it came straight out from God. So you don't update or improve upon God's handiwork. The best you can do is to try to clean up any um, problem areas or contradictions or primitive thoughts or barbarism by saying, well, actually. God whispered the oral law to Moses, and then he whispered it to Joshua. And then by the time you get to the Talmud, you've got a little corrections of the Torah. But there's no way to fix it or to clean it up if it's God's word. And the Talmud has lots of problem areas, too. The, pro the Talmud was advanced compared to the Torah in many ways, but compared to our own sensibility as far as women's rights, the rights of gays, the rights of um, dealing with other people and other nations compared to modern sensibilities it still has a long way to go so there's some problem if you're a, a modern reform reconstructionist cosmic inspirational jew then there's no issues this was written by people and it was our first effort at morality but not our last but when you take the orthodox approach and say this was written by god now you got some explaining to do because you cannot upgrade or improve upon God's handiwork. It's perfect in every regard. So it has to be explained or rationalized in some way. W would you concur with that, Rabbi Khan? 
Um, I think uh, I would not I would not agree with everything you said, but uh, but uh, so I reserve the right to comment. But I think Harris was if you're asking um, about the actual text of the Torah, it's very important to and and I think very meaningful and significant to 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 point out to realize to reflect upon the fact that every imaginable type of Jew when they pick up in the synagogue or in the temple or whatever congregation they go to when they pick up um, the the or they take out a Torah scroll or they pick up the the uh, a copy of the you know of the book itself of the Torah the words are exactly the same in other words no group of Jews has ever I, I shouldn't say well Maybe there is, but I'm assuming, as far as I know, no group of Jews okay. has ever taken the Torah text and said, we're going to change it, we're going to update the text. In terms of the understanding of it, the relevance of it, how they use it, how they apply it, as Rabbi Silver said, there's all kinds of different approaches, um, but, the, but the actual Torah text itself... Uh, and I think it's a beautiful thing. No one has ever tried to say, you know, this is ancient. Why don't we update it? Why don't we make some changes and redact yeah. it? And this, that. It's the exact same Torah scroll and, and books of Torah are in every Jewish, you know, wherever they are in Jewish libraries, wow. Jewish homes, Jewish temples. And I think that's, a, that's the way it should be. We should all have that text and then be able to think about it and interpret it and wonder what it means. How does it apply to us? How do I choose to apply it or not apply it? Uh, let, let me just comment on what Rabbi Khan said, because I actually agree with him on, on this point. That is quite remarkable that the Jewish people revered and cherished the Torah to such an extent that we preserved the writing verbatim of the Torah over thousands of years, despite great pressure and wherever we traveled, we had scribes that worked diligently to get every letter exactly right. And we revere and cherish the Torah because it is ancient. And I also agree with him we should not attempt to alter it because it reflects our people's understanding and our story and biblical truths as understood at that time. It would be horrible if it changed and it did not. Okay. Where Rabbi Khan and I would differ is that I believe the Torah reflects an oral tradition and before it was actually written down and put to writing, there were different traditions, different changes that were made over time there was an oral tradition from the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. We see discrepancies in the Torah that to me reflect different traditions. But once it was written down, there was something about putting it in writing that people thought this is sacred now and this is canon law and this cannot be changed. And I'm glad that they didn't change it because it gives us an insight into what our people believed thousands of years ago. And the Torah, I believe, even though it was not written by God, in my opinion, is still invaluable. And it is one of the greatest gifts to humanity because it's our first effort to understand history, our first effort to explain the beginnings of the universe, our first effort to try to understand morality and how we should live with others, our first effort to get a glimpse of a better world. I think it was our first, not our best. I think it was our first, not our last but it is cherished for that reason. And it gives a vision of humanity that we still haven't achieved. So Rabbi Khan and I both agree that the Torah is precious and should be cherished for different reasons. But I do agree with him. It's a beautiful, remarkable thing that we should be very proud of as Jews that the Torah has been preserved intact. If you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls from about 2000 years ago, you see that Torah, you'll see the same Torah that we have today. Thank you very much. Any, anybody else wanted to ask any questions or offer any comments? Um, Rabbi Khan, you know, our, our time together may be limited in that I know that you are uh, moving on to a full-time position, which I am really thrilled because I, I think that wherever you go, Whatever school you're at, they're going to be lucky to have you. And I'm glad to see someone, I believe, from the uh, from the Orthodox perspective, who has a, a type of universal view towards Judaism, who, who's able to transcend denominational lines and to see 
the Jewish people as one. And I, I think that that's a great thing. And I'm, I'm glad that you're going to have influence upon children. But I just want to share this with you and see what your response might be. And feel free to ask me any questions as well. Uh, my, one of my heroes, Carl Sagan, said that extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. So for instance, if I told you this morning I had a bagel for breakfast, you wouldn't say, prove it. I need evidence or I don't believe it. I, that's, that's crazy. <laughs> but if I told you this morning I ate a bagel on Mars, you would probably not believe me just because I said it unless I came up with some incredible, <laughs> extraordinary proof, <laughs> like a picture of me on Mars eating a bagel. And even then you say, you doctored that picture. I don't believe it. So my question to you is, you maintain that God wrote the Torah. To me, that's an extraordinary claim that the supreme intelligence of the universe came down to primitive Bronze Age people and yeah. dictated an infallible doctrine that contains all proof or all truth and no error. That's an incredible statement to make. And, and my question, and I believe you also said the same thing more or less about the Talmud, that it reflects oral law eventually written down, which is an extraordinary claim. And the Christians make the same claim about their scripture and uh, Muslims do too, and so the Buddhists and all these others. So my question to you is in our last remaining sessions <laughs> is, do you have extraordinary evidence or proof to support that extraordinary claim? Or do you maintain that we as Jews should just accept it as faith without any such evidence? Or is it a combination? It's, a, it's an excellent question. It's a fundamental, you know, a question of fundamental importance, I think, in Jewish philosophy and in Jewish thought. Um, and uh, it is not an easy question to answer. I think that ultimately, and, and, I, and I'll talk in a moment a little bit about proof in, in that sense, but I think ultimately every Jewish person um, really has to, I think has an obligation as a Jew and as a descendant of, uh, of the people of the book, of the people of the Torah, has an obligation to think about that question, to ponder it, to read, to study, to research, to become as familiar as he or she can with the words of the Torah. Because if a person doesn't read the Torah and study the Torah and think about it and, and really um, research its own words and the questions and historical issues there, um, then, then it's hard to express any kind of opinion about, and, and, and you can't express an informed opinion and a, and, a, and, a, and a reasonable opinion. So I think one of, you used the word gift previously. I think one of the gifts that we've received as Jews, as individual Jews, is the gift of the Torah and the ability, the, the free will, the free choice, the ability to say, hey, let me study this. My ancestors thousands of years ago, you know, risked their lives and gave their lives up to the present time. Jews have sacrificed and dedicated their lives to preserving the values and the lessons of the Torah. Let me at least study this and read it and discuss it as we do in a small way every week. This is an excellent example. Our weekly session is devoted to, uh, at least in part, devoted to studying the weekly uh, Torah portion. I think that's a beautiful, beautiful um, thing. And, and ultimately, each person has to decide for himself or herself. I, I don't, I don't, I think it would be naive and disingenuous for me or anyone to say, hey, I can, I, you give me five minutes, I'll prove it to you and you'll see, absolutely, this is all true, this is all, you know, um, it, my, it, it, it doesn't, things don't work that way. Shifting over to the actual content of the question. Rabbi, Rabbi Khan, by the way, I'll, I'll be glad to give you 10 minutes if you'd like. Okay, <laughs> ten, 10 minutes I might be able to do. Um, so, so. <laughs> to me, the starting point, to the starting point of believing in the ideas expressed in the Torah, the starting point is belief in a creator. And that to me is the fundamental question that every human being, not just every Jew, that every human being should ask themselves and really think seriously about. And that is we live in a world where there is absolutely no doubt that there are 
almost unlimited signs of design and planning in the world. Any scientist, any mathematician, any reasonable thinking person will would say, you don't, you, you don't come up with a one-celled organism without being amazed at the planning and the design and how it can reproduce itself and much less a, a, a plant or a tree, much less an animal and then a human being, the incredible, incredible precision of all of the systems that work in the human being that allow us to see, to think, to smell, to hear, to taste, to reproduce, to live, to function are, are absolutely extraordinary. But, the, but then the question becomes, well, if we are seem to be designed and formed in this way, isn't that proof of a designer and a creator who had extraordinary abilities beyond anything that science can, you know, can imagine or anything that human beings can do? And some people say, yes, yes, that it, there, this it does. The, the universe itself and all of its systems and the, and the planets and the stars and the constellations prove there has to be a designer and we call, or some, some people could call that designer God, or you could call it the creator or the designer. And that being is, is in terms of abilities and knowledge and engineering skill and know-how is, is beyond anything that exists in the world. There's nothing human that can possibly compare to it. And other people take a very different approach. And that approach is to say that there is no designer, there is no creator. And the fact that if there appears to be so much design and uh, in the world and so many systems that function and depend upon each other is just random chance that developed over billions of years. And if, you, if, if there are billions of years to talk about that anything can happen over time and one thing can lead to another thing and evolution can cause all of these amazing things, but never make the mistake, according to the school of thought, the second school of thought, never make the mistake of saying, because there's design and intricate design, seemingly there must be a designer or a creator. No, this all happened randomly. It all happened by chance. We're all here by chance. We all exist by chance. There is no creator or designer. To me, that's the fundamental question. And I would submit, and I, and I lead my life based upon this idea, I would submit that for reasonable people, the universe proves that there's a designer and a creator. Now, there's a big step to go from that statement to say, Oh, and this creator came and revealed himself and to the Jewish people and spoke to Moses and dictated um, the laws of the Torah. That's a very big step. And if a person says to me, I kind of get where you're going with the design and everything, and I understand that, and wow, that's a lot to think about, but that's got, that doesn't prove that this designer and creator wrote the Torah, dictated the Torah. I, I can see that's absolutely true. When you shift over to looking at the Torah, then to me the issue becomes, does it make sense to say that a book from thousands of years ago that contains so many projections and predictions that have played themselves out in history in miraculous ways, apparently miraculous ways, all the way up to modern time with the rise of the state of Israel talked about and predicted thousands of years ago in, in the Torah and the books that followed it, you have to think about that. You have to wonder about that. Really? Thousands of years ago, people said these things, these ideas, and we're still inspired by them, and, and, and things have played out that no one would ever have predicted. The return of the Jewish people to their land in 1948, no one would have predicted that that was a possibility and that that was going to happen in modern times, and that they would rebuild the commonwealth that they've rebuilt with such incredible success. So I, I, I don't, I can't offer, I wish I could. I wish I was knowledgeable enough and scholarly enough to be able to say, you know, let me send everyone a copy of my book that proves all of these things, but I can't do that. And I, and I don't have the knowledge and the skill to do that. But for me, that first point about the, the universe proving a designer creator is for me, I, is, is rock solid. I really believe in that. And then the second idea of the Torah coming from God, I get that that's a very hard pill to swallow and not, and not something that could be easily proven. But I do think it's, it's more balanced than that. There are a lot of things to think about that could lead a person to move in that direction and, and have obviously led a lot of Jewish people and other, other religions as well to believe, I mean, Christianity and Islam both assert the truth 
of the Torah as being a document that was originally true. And then God added things later on and changed his mind in certain ways uh, later on, which is also kind of fascinating that they believe that our book is true and they assert that in their own religion. So that's about as much as I can do with that question in, a, in this time period. <laughs> um, let, let me just share my point of view on that topic and, uh, and commend you also for providing a very lucid explanation about why you believe the way you do. And also, I think you presented a very good uh, representation about the orthodox point of view. As, as I've heard expressed by uh, Rabbi Sachs, a blessed memory and other Orthodox rabbis who I've listened to. L let me just speak about the first point that you made that the, the universe and the earth seem to reflect a designer, okay? I, I think that it reflects the exact opposite. There's absolutely no evidence whatsoever for a designer and all the evidence goes the other way. Um, it, all the evidence seems to reflect a lack of design, a lack of a creator. L let me just explain a little bit. Let, let's just take human evolution, for instance, okay? Humans, uh, we haven't evolved too well. Our uh, adrenal glands that control our emotions are, are much further developed along than our uh, cognitive uh, thinking processes of the mind so that we're, we're affected by our emotion more than our cerebral cortex. So we didn't do a very good job in evolving that way because we're constantly fighting, killing each other, getting angry. So if we we're gonna be designed, we could have been designed in a way that would have made us a little more uh, peaceful and less uh, lethal. Also, if we were designed, it's hard to understand why, we do, why do we have a tailbone? It, it, the tailbone indicates that we evolved out of primates and used to have a tail. Otherwise, there would be no reason for human beings to still have a tailbone unless we obviously evolved from primates that had a tail. There's also no reason why a designer would have given us an appendix. The appendix does us no earthly good. All it does is once in a while it explodes and kills us. There's really no good reason why a designer would give us an appendix. If you look at evolution, you understand why, because when we ate raw meat, the appendix came in handy, but now it doesn't do us any good, it only hurts us. It's also hard to understand why we get goose pimples and our hair seems to stand up because mammals make their hair stand up to appear bigger, but we don't even have any hair. So we're just trying to scare somebody with a, with a relic of the past that doesn't really do us very much good. It's also hard to understand why if we were designed we would have bad backs. Why do we get bad backs when we're older? That's obviously a vestige of walking on all fours. And because we were meant, we evolved to walk upright, it caused us to have bad backs. A good designer would have designed us in such a way that we wouldn't have a bad back. Also a good designer wouldn't have given us the same tube for swallowing and breathing so we can choke to death. A better designer would have designed us in a way that there were two separate tubes so we wouldn't choke to death. And a better designer could have designed us in many, many ways. And when you talk about the, um, the incredible senses that we have, like hearing and seeing and, and, and the sense of smell, the, these things are wondrous indeed, but they all clearly evolved. I mean, you can look back at the fossil record and you can see eyesight going from extremely primitive where organisms could only perceive light and dark and they could sort of move towards the light. And then gradually they could make out better shapes until vision evolved to what we have today. Same thing with our ears and same thing with our ability to sense pain. I mean, all of these things clearly evolved. Um, by the way, it, it was not done, as you say, by random chance. There's absolutely no random, well, there, the, evolution doesn't happen by random chance. Evolution happens by natural selection in which the raw materials are random, but the the, what appears to be the design is actually the result of natural selection, which gets rid of the bad and preserves the good. So there's absolutely no, in, no indication that we're designed. If we were designed, then the designer did a horrible job because for about uh, 2 million years, human beings had an average lifespan of about 25 years. And we lived in misery and suffering and fear and and, and we were designed in such a way that our life was horrible for about 2 million years until we started coming up with some 
modern medicine that helped a little bit. Also 98% of all species that ever lived have been destroyed and went extinct, some design. Also, if you look at the universe, most of the planets and the stars have been destroyed, cataclys cataclysmic destruction. So there's just random massive chaos and destruction going on. So to me, it doesn't speak of a designer, but you are right. To even if there was a designer and a creator, to get from there to God writing the Torah is a huge insurmountable leap. Now, your evidence that you put forward that I heard was well, they predicted the return of the Jewish people to Israel. That's an incredible prophecy. That proves to me, that's the incredible, extraordinary proof that proves it to me. Except the only problem is that that prophecy was reporting something that happened in the past. Because the prophecies of the Jews returning to Israel happened repeatedly in the past. It happened when the Jews came back out of Egypt and they returned back into Israel. It happened when the Jews were in Babylonian captivity and they returned back into Israel. Both of those things happened before the Torah was canonized. So what you're talking about is not a prophecy at all. You're talking about somebody saying something that already occurred. And what was obvious in Jewish history is the Jews were constantly exiled and coming back, exiled, coming back. So to predict that the Jews were going to return to Israel uh, would be about the same as predicting that a kid would probably get a B in math one day because it keeps happening every once in a while. There's absolutely, I would maintain, zero evidence zero prophecy in the Torah to support that extraordinary claim. And uh, there's, the Christians make the same claim about Christian scripture. Oh, the, they fulfilled all these prophecies, which of course they didn't. And the Quran also says that they fulfilled all these prophecies, which of course they didn't either. Which is why uh, I, from my father, I learned to believe based on evidence and science that the Torah was written by human beings, not by God. Um, I know that's a pretty heavy subject. And um, I, I agree with you on this, Rabbi Khan, that it is something that every Jewish person should think about long and hard because it will determine everything about their Jewish beliefs. It'll determine their entire worldview. And before we take a view of agreeing with Rabbi Khan, or agreeing with me, I think every Jewish person and every non-Jew should study hard and learn and make their own decision based on, hopefully on the evidence. But I am glad that you didn't say that we should just rely on faith because I think that's a very dangerous um, way to form our beliefs. Uh, Rabbi Khan, I, I, uh, you took quite a while explaining your view. I took a while explaining mine. I'll be glad to um, give you any time if you wanna respond or we can just turn it over to others, whatever is your uh, I, liking. Thank you. I definitely am very, very interested in what you had to say. And I do have one question and that I'm actually a little surprised by, but I do want to open it up. So I'll just pose the question first. It would seem to me that it's self-evident that the great scientists that have ever lived from the beginning of science until today and the great, you know, um, uh, medical figures and researchers and really people in every field that involves studying the, the world we live in and the phenomenon in the world, when they do so, they do it with a mindset of we're going to find, we're assuming from the start that there is an order and that there are natural laws and that things fit together. Um, they don't assume, well, it's just a total mess. It's just total chaos. And there's no way that we're going to find anything that fits together. Um, you know, the, the, uh, it doesn't mean, I'm not saying it would be a foolish, absurd to say that every researcher and every scientist can explain everything and their explanations never change because of these ideas of, of, of design and issue. But again, let's just imagine for a moment a brain surgeon or a heart surgeon when they actually take the scalpel and open up the chest or do or, or open up the skull to do a surgery, they don't throw up their hands and say, oh my goodness, we can't do anything. 
we can't help this guy. It's a total mess in here. They have studied the brain and the, and the, and the heart and all of the systems of the body and how they interact and have seen the incredible, incredible design and learned how it all works together. And they're basing what they're doing on that, what medicines work, what surgeries work, what procedures work. If it's not designed and it's not planned and there's no order to it, and it's just chaos and, 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 uh, and uh, stuff that came to be somehow by throwing it all together over a billion, billions of years. I just don't think that that works. I just don't. I think that really every scientist and researcher would say, no, there's a lot of order. There's a lot of natural law. There's a lot of stuff here that is repetitive that we see over and over again. And it has to, we can rely on that. Now, I'm not saying they then take the step and say, that proves there's a God and a designer. I'm the one who's arguing that it proves there's a God and a designer. But I just think that it, we can find all kinds of little things and say, wow, if there's a designer, why did these things happen? But that's a little bit like taking a Swiss watch and saying, you know what? We can find better ways to make a watch, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't a group of people who designed that watch with great care <laughs> and meticulousness. They did. But, but okay, we can find ways to do something better that we think it would be better to make it that way when we might not understand the full picture. But I guess what I'm most surprised about was to, to seem to me, I might have misunderstood, um, not to give such short shrift, so to speak, to this idea of, of, of a natu natural laws and order and design in the universe. I, it, just, it seems to me everyone would agree that it's there. The question becomes, how did it get there? Uh, very, very good point, Rabbi Khan. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, I, you're correct that every scientist agrees that there are natural laws that govern the universe. And so when I was talking about the way that the animals have evolved, that was done through natural selection. However, natural selection operates within a universe that operates according to natural laws and physical laws, laws of gravity and of motion and chemical laws. So every scientist, all of them agree that there are natural laws, but they don't agree that these natural laws emanated from a divine creative power. So you're hundred percent correct about that. Let me also mention this, that for a very long time, most scientists believed in God. They believe that God was the source of those natural laws. The, the last ones who did were really Galileo and Newton, who also believed that the natural laws bespeak a natural intelligence, and they must have been brought forward by a natural intelligence because they had no explanation for how all the different animals and how all the living things got there. It looked like they had to be designed until, until Darwin. Ever since Darwin came along and gave an explanation, a rational explanation that didn't require a God to explain how every, all the living things got here, ever since then, then most scientists didn't believe in God anymore. Today, if you took a survey of scientists, most of them, probably 80, 90% don't believe in a God at all. And if you look at evolutionary biologists, scientists who specialize in studying evolution and zoology, like, 0.1% of them would believe in a God. So the, the classic story about this is uh, with Laplace and Napoleon, where Napoleon asked Na Laplace for his model of the universe. It was called an orrery. And Laplace showed him the, the design of the universe, how the, the planets and everything. And Napoleon said, "Where? I understand all this, but where is God? And, and Laplace said in French, je n'ai pas besoin de cette hypothèse. I don't have any need of this hypothesis. It works perfectly well without it. And once the universe and the motion of the planets was understood without God moving everything around and living things evolved without God doing it, once it became superfluous to have a God, then because of Occam's razor, choosing the simplest explanation, it no longer made sense to presuppose that God designed all this stuff. And I would, I would repeat that for most of human history, human beings only lived a short life. And it was most kids like died in childbirth, women died in childbirth, horrible diseases. So it'd be like kind of like somebody designing a car 
and 90% of them destroy themselves within a very short amount of time after they were manufactured. You wouldn't think very much of the designer. So it doesn't really seem from that perspective to reflect a, a designer. But I, I do agree with you that um, everyone should study that and make their own decision. And I, and I do thank you, Rabbi Khan, for uh, engaging in this dialogue so that people can hear two different sides and try to uh, determine which one makes sense to them. Um, you know, we spend all of our time talking about this, and I don't know if there's any time left if anybody wants to talk about this or current events or the Torah reading, but let's open it up to others and see if anybody um, wants to move us in a certain direction or offer their own thoughts or insights into some of the things we've discussed. Emily, go right ahead. I am going to miss these discussions when Rabbi Khan is gone. <laughs> I mean, absolutely fantastic. It is so rare to see two points discussed rationally um, and backed up. And thank you. I say amen to that. And I thank Rabbi Khan for engaging in this dialogue, which is very valuable. There are not a lot of people listening in, and I thank each of you for being here. But this will be preserved and recorded. And I think that when um, we engage in social media and put this out to the masses, I think a lot of people will be very interested in hearing uh, what you've had to say, Rabbi Khan, and, uh, and listening to these uh, dialogues. So with that in mind, with posterity in mind, if there's anything else <laughs> you'd like to share or anybody well, else. I think, um, I think Valerie had her hand up. Go ahead, Go ahead Valerie. Valerie. Well, I would just like to, I just like to, you know, reiterate what Emily said. This was a very, and I know I came in late, but this portion of the conversation has been absolutely fascinating. You really, both of you have been really engaged, you know, the thought processes, and you can see where the, it's ra rational from the Rabbi Barry's perspective, and it's very rational from Rabbi Khan's perspective, and they're, they're, there it is where, the, where, the, where the, the quagmire is for so many people. I know for myself, my experience, as you said, if you don't read the Torah and you don't know exactly what it says, how can you make a decision? Where I think most, most Jewish people such as myself that have gone from uh, orthodox to reform to reconstructionist, our experience with religion has been, been, been experiential. It hasn't really been definitive. Most of us don't, don't read the Talmud or don't read the Torah. Many of us don't speak or understand the language. So it's everything that we understand from this language is experiential. It's how we experienced and who's taught this to us and the temples that we, we went to and the rabbis that we've talked to and, and, and the family and the upbringing and the ritual. That's how we understand religion. So to hear conversations that really delve into the, the actual meat of what, what this whole thing is about is just fascinating. It really is. And I thank you, you know, both for doing that. Well, thank, thank you, Valerie. And I do encourage everyone not to accept the teachings or the prognostications of religious leaders and to examine it for yourself because there's a lot at stake for religious leaders. They want to make people believe a certain way because then they increase the amount of followers they have, the amount of revenues they have, and they want to in indoctrinate people, not just rabbis, but people of all religious leaders across the board are telling their people, believe this, believe that, and it might not make any sense. I happen to know from speaking with other rabbis that a lot of rabbis don't believe what they're saying either, nor do a lot of other ministers, but that's what they do for, that's how they make a living, all right, by getting people to believe certain things. Each one of us is blessed with the greatest gift of all, a rational mind that has the ability to think and understand and to discern. Never, ever, ever cede your own thinking to someone else and let them do your thinking for you. That, that is never a good idea. And also, you will be much stronger in your faith and in your beliefs and in your Judaism, if you've actually done the research and believe through your own analysis, rather than, well, somebody told me this, so I kind of believe it, because that's kind of a, a half-hearted belief. If, for instance, if, you, if somebody said, are you 
were you born in America? You wouldn't say, well, I believe I was born in America. You would say, yes, I was born in America. So the minute you say, I believe something, you're already not really too sure. <laughs> so if you really do the research and the homework and you thought it through and you, and you know, you don't have to say, well, I, I believe this. You'll say, I know. And when you know, that's a very comforting feeling compared to, well, I think so, or somebody told me, or that's what I'm supposed to believe. Anybody else? Sharon, go ahead. So again, to piggyback on what Emily and Valerie have so eloquently shared, having this conversation tonight, which was much different than other nights, <laughs> that sounds like a Pesach uh, <laughs> thing, but um, just being able to hear and share um, the viewpoints and the perspectives, it's just so awakening and it's so exciting. I, I wish there were a hundred people on here to hear this. I really do. And, and yeah, there's only a few of us, but like Rabbi said, it'll be on YouTube and people can, but it's just, just your honesty, Rabbi Khan, your honesty, Rabbi Silver, just being able to, to back up your point of views and share examples. I mean, I don't think we, we readily get that, you know, maybe, maybe we were raised Orthodox and, you know, there were two rabbis talking that were both Orthodox and we listened to them, or maybe we went to a reform synagogue and there were two reform rabbis and we listened to them pretty similar, but to have the perspective of what you two brought to the table today and what you've brought for the past year that we've been doing this, it's just, it is just awesome. It is just so wonderful. It is so invigorating and exciting. It's a rare opportunity. And I'm sorry to see that it's gonna be coming to an end shortly because I think we all learn from this and I just enjoy it thoroughly. I look forward to this evening and I enjoy every moment of it. Thank you, Rabbi Barry. Thank you, Rabbi Zvi. And I appreciate your time. Well, thank you, Sharon. And uh, I'll just wrap it up with this and then maybe Rabbi Khan, you can have a concluding comment as well. Um, first of all, this is not the end, this is the beginning. I'm sure Rabbi Khan and I will have opportunities in the future to discuss. It might not be on a weekly basis, but we will. Also, there are um, there are precious few Orthodox rabbis who are willing to do what Rabbi Khan does. Most of them will not come on and subject their views to the light of reason and dialogue. It doesn't happen too often, but who knows? Maybe they will find somebody else. But I do greatly appreciate Rabbi Khan being here. And I have to tell you that I, I've been somewhat, I guess, on good behavior or restrained in some way because I've, I've engaged in gladiatorial rhetorical combat with people of a different point of view. And I will just tell you this, that I agree that this was a fascinating exchange, but we've really just scratched the surface. I mean, if Rabbi Khan wanted to take his gloves off and, and challenge some of my views, he would do a lot more than just say, well, you know, it doesn't it seem like there's a design. He, he'd have a lot more to say if he wanted to, and I encourage him to do that in the future. And if I wanted to take my gloves off and follow up as I would as an attorney and a rabbi, we're really, really just scratching the surface. But I agree with what you're saying, Sharon, that this is not done enough. It's hardly done at all. It's almost never done between the political parties where you have a Republican and Democrat sit down and, and have a, a rational, peaceful discussion. It's almost never done between Jews and Christians where you have a rational discussion about who is Jesus or Jews and Muslims. It's almost never done. And that is a real shame. And it's a reason why people believe so much nonsense because their views are not held up to the light of reason. And um, I can only tell you this, Sharon and others, as long as I have breath to speak, I will continue to engage in dialogue and rational discourse with people I disagree with. And, and I will share my point of view that disagrees with the other person because I think that is the best way that we can learn and the best way that we can get to know each other. And uh, I cherish the, uh, the time that Rabbi Khan has given to us so that we can engage in that with him. I do have a video of me 
debating one-on-one -on -one with a Jew who accepted Jesus, uh, what they call a Messianic Jew, which I just think is a mess. But you can hear that. It might even be on, uh, <laughs> might even be on YouTube. And we went at it and it was wild. And if you really wanna see a fascinating exchange, check it out. And I hope to do that in the future as well. Rabbi Khan, I'd love to see you take on a fundamentalist Christian, see what arguments you would raise, because I think it would be quite quite interesting. But it's always a pleasure to, to uh, dialogue with you. And I'll, I'll close it up at that. And uh, Rabbi Khan, I'll give you the last word. I just want to say that next week, God willing, I'll definitely be on. And then I do need a summer pause. Um, but I, I want to come back. I want to I want to work it out to continue this dynamic. As Rabbi Silver said, it might not be every week, but I don't know my full schedule yet for next the next school year. Um, but I don't want this to stop. This is this is very valuable to me, to all of us. And, and so hopefully we'll figure out a way for it to continue. If not, in the, it could be in the same form after the summer, or it might be in a little bit of a different form, but we, we should keep this going and we should get more people involved and God willing, we'll be able to do that. Rabbi Khan, Good luck to you in your endeavors. Good night, everybody. You Take much. care. Shalom.